<clears throat> we are live ish words about books is a poorly written poorly acted poorly edited podcast it stars two would-be writers i'm nate and my co-host here is ben hello this week we are continuing with the fold by peter klein so if you haven't listened to that yet you should probably go back and listen to it. A quick recap. Last part ended with our beloved, good, resident prankster Bob walking through the portal and becoming a cancer-ridden half-dead man. Jamie opened up to Mike at the bar over the fact that her co-worker is dead and she is horribly scarred. Literally. And, yes. Emotionally yes. and physically. <laughs> Yes, her back is a humongous mess from an accident she had on a motorcycle and as a teenager. We should point out that a lesser writer may have just made her scarred emotionally, but her physical scars are symbolic of her deeper emotional scars about yes. the fact Bra that she's, she's ugly Peter. because she has scars. Bravo to, to Peter Kleins for, for tackling this uh really really deep material I, I don't know how he's gonna resolve this but uh well i'm he's, looking he's, forward he's starting to open up yeah and i'm looking forward to watching them so so i don't know what's gonna happen in this because uh i don't i don't read the books um yeah, we're, we're reading it in real time yeah so so i'm looking forward to finding out how mike is going to uh work with jamie and and, and as they're love well it's not really love yet but as the relationship blossoms into something that could become love i'm i'm really looking forward to the journey these two are going to take and how mike is going to maybe help jamie along the path towards healing some of her emotional scars and realizing that her physical scars you know they're not they're not who she is and together i think they're both going to grow and become better people and really it's it's just going to be a beautiful thing to watch I, I i love it when books include such such complicated romance between two such you know just just an unlikely pair and then jamie does another crosswalk through the portal and she wants to make out with mike yeah and i'll admit that was a little sudden um i i i thought perhaps things were rushed but she did just experience a uh a tragic event and you know now she's elated at the fact that she also wasn't turned into a cancer ridden monster which i guess she had like a what a one in 160 chance of doing so right. um i could see why she was happy and and maybe looking to uh grab life by the horns you know but but yeah so this is like uh, you know I'm, I'm glad to see she's opening up to mike and and maybe maybe they'll be taking that emotional journey together yeah, so so what happens is uh, Olaf justifies her walking through the gate because the other 160 or so times, someone didn't die. Therefore, it was a good idea to test. And hey, the test went well, and now she seems a lot happier. So, you know, bonus points. And they just proved, without a shadow of a doubt, that the thing with Bob was a fluke. Yeah, no, it's certainly not... Uh, criminal negligence to perform a no, crosswalk absolutely. the day after somebody just died performing a crosswalk and it would be idiotic for a scientist to associate their magical machine with the death of a person using that machine I mean it could have been anything that caused that like Bob do we know uh, what he ate for breakfast this morning because yeah sure. did he forget to brush his teeth yeah that, that could have done it you never know there's there's so many factors and i think the only thing that any any reasonable person could have done is to immediately walk through that door again and the fact that nothing happened to her this time um that proves, proves that it, wasn't it, it, it will never happen again right exactly yeah and i'm sure that Arthur fully understands this machine 
He knows for a fact, for a certainty, that it was not the door. He is a brilliant scientist, man. Well, and who... I would, and I'm sure Arthur, you know, and I'm just I'm going to talk on his behalf a little bit here. I'm sure Arthur would be happy to uh, explain in great detail why it couldn't possibly be the door. Now, now, Arthur, could you just tell me um, how you know it wasn't the door? Oh, because Arthur, I Arthur's mean... telling me to fuck off for asking. Uh, fuck because, you, fuck yeah. you for even thinking well, that. Um, so, well, so he also says that Reggie has invested too much in the project to shut it down. Ergo, not the door's fault. Ergo, yes, that's ergo. A, that's, that's 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 Latin that's... <laughs> for shut the fuck up. <laughs> and so, coming back to reality for a second, you know these people need to be stopped. If I were Mike. <laughs> 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 I love the way you said that. Yes, absolutely. These people are lunatics. Yeah. Um, so they they obviously need to be stopped. And Mike, Mike has to have realized at this point that the people he's working with have absolutely gone insane. And whatever is going on with this door, it obviously scrambles the brains of anyone who uses it. And he needs to get out of there before they kill him to keep him silent. He needs to get and out of possibly there. Possibly eat him. Yeah. And they could kill him by making him walk through that door uh, because sometimes that happens. Uh, so he needs to get out of there. And I'm really, really interested in seeing how Mike is going to escape without arousing the suspicions of the obviously mad scientists and how he's going to get back to Reggie and, and get in there before they use the door to like destroy the world. Um, well, you know, what's helpful. They're saying they're sending Jamie off to the hospital to get checked out and Arthur's going with her. So he only has to deal with Olaf, Sasha and that other guy whose name is important because he has no personality. So, so he, his, it's, it's only oh, okay. one on three now instead of one on five. I'm going to stop you. His name's Neil. And that oh is his God. personality. Oh, shoot. You're right. I'm yeah. sorry. He's that a Neil. Was, that was my fault. He's a Neil. He's a Neil. Yeah. So, okay. So let's see how Mike is going to slip out of there and, and get back with the cops to shut this down. Well, well, first, actually, before before he, he decides to slip out of there, he, he notices that he can still see Site B, even though the rings are off. And uh, so he... So he asks Olaf, like, hey, is, is the power on? And, and Olaf's like, yeah, you idiot. That's why you can totally hear the sound. God, what, what an idiot. I can't wait to kill and eat this guy. And then, and then he, he kind of pauses and realizes that, oh, shit, the portal's still open, even though the rings are shut down. And um, he, he stops being such a dick after that. Yeah, and it's, it's amazing that um, nobody knows why the gate is open. Uh, Olaf theorizes that it could be an after image uh, and it, uh, after what I don't know uh, or some sort of gravitational anomaly or something he he's he's really spitballing and, and grasping for straws here yeah and Sasha says that it it's a scar in the fabric of space-time it, they've they've cut space-time so many times that now it's scarred open and you might be thinking that that's not um, how scars work. You can't <laughs> you can't scar open. The, yeah, that's scar not tissue a scar. Doesn't, doesn't that's, grow away from the wound. Yeah, that's, and keep it open. That's just an open wound. Um, so <laughs> Neil politely stands there. Are, and, are you sure I'm the medical guy? Because that was that was some top notch. Uh, did you did you go to medical school for a little bit to to get that knowledge? Um. I'm going to be honest. Obviously. On so I'm not a published author. Um, so I'm still in the stage of my career where I have to do a lot of research before I, I speak. So, uh -huh. yeah, I actually, I, I spent a lot of time Googling. And by, by a lot of time, I mean like, uh, like three seconds. Took me about three I seconds. Um, that's the kind of time you have when you're not a published author. So. Well, Peter Coins had some deadlines. Uh, yeah, he needed he needed to get this script out rather quickly. Um, 
It happens. So, you know, yeah, you know it whatever. happens. Yeah. A little mistake. The editor the editor will catch it. So later, one one right? mistake, I'm sure there there aren't any more. So um, of course not. Arthur comes back. Uh, Jamie's fine. That's that's good. Uh, we don't know what tests they're doing. I'm guessing she got a physical. Somebody like listened to her heart. They took her blood. I think they, I think they mentioned maybe they do a CT of her head. You know, add some add, yeah. add some tests on top of that. That you know, it, it sounds like what you would do in that situation. And you you can trust Peter Klein's. Yeah, so they're testing. They don't they don't know what they'd be testing for, but they're they're doing all the tests. So they do all the tests on Jamie, and she's fine. She's totally normal. Um, it, it's interesting that while doing all the tests on Jamie, and keeping in mind, keeping in mind that Jamie, they have a doctor on retainer, right? They do. They have a doctor on retainer who has tested all these people every time they've gone through the crosswalk. And so they do a complete physical on Jamie. They do all the testing. They do the CT scan. And they I'm sure they have a very intelligent person carefully analyze the CT scan. I know where you're going with this. But there's one just minor thing <laughs> that the doctor who uh, has seen her multiple times before missed. And it's a thing anybody could have missed. Um. <laughs> God, she, I can't she, believe I didn't think of this until just fucking now. Oh my god. She has um like major scarring across her entire back, say like like fifty percent of her torso. Um and right. and that's better now. <laughs> Those are it's just gone now. Yeah, and the doctor didn't uh you know it's 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 easy to overlook. I know when you're doing a physical, you don't actually um, look at the person's back or touch the person's back or put a stethoscope to the person's back. Um, you just, you just do a CT scan. So they, they missed that. And it's going to be an important detail later. It's well, a subtle well, detail. Well, c- cut this doctor some slack. He's not Dr. House. Okay. He's not going to notice a subtle detail and then figure out an entire magic diagnosis, uh, you know, some complex, crazy stuff that you see one in a, a million cases a year. So, it, it, yeah, it's it's a tiny detail to miss, and he's not a super genius. Okay? Sudden reversal of deep tissue scarring is, it's just one of those things you see sometimes. Well, maybe maybe it scarred open, and it healed that way. Shit. And then she just, she just shaved off the excess tissue, and it was smoothed out again. You know, I, every time I start... Every time I start questioning the logic of this book, I just realized that I was I was dumb the whole time. There is just these are the insights that I don't have into the medical community because I'm not a doctor. I couldn't possibly like it it's not fair to expect an author to know the intricacies of every medical procedure. Like I'm sure Peter Kleins has never actually had a physical. <laughs> So he wouldn't no. he wouldn't Why know would he? that they listen to the back of your chest sometimes and that they lift up your shirt to do that. He wouldn't know. Um but it's a good thing Arthur went with her. Yeah, so he he cannot know as well. Um Yeah, and then and then of course he he comes back and um you know, he kind of blows off Mike's concern about this whole space-time continuum thing is is scarred open you know he's like mike you're being melodramatic like yeah okay fine a person is dead and a person you know, is someone dead else could have died the machine is out of control yeah but you're, you're being melodramatic mike like jesus this is science mike things happen and then you try to figure out why they happen that's science okay we're doing science here mike gonna need you to shut the fuck up okay yeah okay God. Ergo, Mike. Ergo. <laughs> so, nobody knows why the gate's open. Uh, Mike tells Arthur that it's it's really time to stop keeping secrets. A man is dead. He's risked the life of his co-workers. He may have damaged the literal space-time continuum. Ergo, Mike. Ergo. <laughs> Shut up. Um, so, they do decide that they need to take one precaution. They need to watch the gate to make sure it doesn't do anything weird. 
Right, yeah. And what they would do if it did, that's not clear. <laughs> they'll uh, they'll throw some coins at it or, yeah. or a rock or something. Or they'll, or they'll say, hey, cut it out, gate. So the gate is under constant... Yeah, the gate is under constant supervision. Um, so at least you know, at least we know it's not going anywhere. Probably. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to get up and and move to another town or something. Yeah. It's staying right there. It's in timeout. Okay. Yeah. So, as we've established, that I don't know if we established it, but donuts are a big deal in this lab. Um, yeah, we, we 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 skimped over this last time, and I apologize for that. This is actually. A, a very important point that that goes it's like a thread through almost the entire book yeah so everybody here's an interesting thing okay everybody in the lab they they do a donut order unlike every office i've ever worked in where they just get like a dozen assorted donuts they do a donut order and everybody gets a specific donut and there's one extra donut for some reason even though everybody gets a specific donut, there is one, no one, eats this one. There is one jelly donut that, as near as I could tell, they got before Mike came. They got the jelly donut specifically to throw it away because they're disgusting. So Mike's had to eat this gross jelly donut every day. But today, there's a chocolate croissant there. And Mike he loves, 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 loves chocolate croissants. He wants made love. This is like to a, a chocolate croissant. This is like a uh, a high school romance that just yeah. that just stuck with him. So he's like, "Wow, who who ordered a chocolate croissant? How did you know? Did you guys know that I liked these? I I know I was accusing you of murder yesterday, but um, I'm really happy that somebody could." Just think of me for once, you know? I, I've been here for weeks, and nobody ever asked me if I wanted a donut, and I thought that was rude, um, but but somebody... And you know, there, and you know it, it's probably uh, a way to keep him from running to the police and getting the fuck out of there. This chocolate croissant, Mike loves it. He is going to stick around because he's getting this. So Mike asks Anne. Anne didn't order the donut. Neil didn't order the donut. Then Jamie walks in, and she's like... I ordered the donut. And Neil goes, wow, she's a lot more pleasant since she went to the doctor. Here she is ordering donuts for people when she used to just hate us. Um, yeah, that's that's exactly it. That doctor performed a different kind of physical that didn't involve the back, but did involve the mood. You know. <laughs> So Mike suggests, oh, hey, maybe Jamie's just starting to like me. Neil laughs in his face because that couldn't possibly be true. Um, because Jamie doesn't like anyone. No, and... Jamie Jamie is incapable of feeling anything other than disdain and hatred. At best, you're going to get indifferent. Mike is trying to understand why the scientists are behaving so strangely. And... He comes, he, he, it reminds him of something. And the ants quickly bring up an image of a girl that is probably 16 at the time. She's one of Mike's students, and Peter Kleins describes her as being flat chested, which I thought was a weird thing to say. Uh, yeah, a little strange. About an underage um, student. But again, not a published author. So. Yeah, maybe when we, when we become published, we can get away with that. Get away with? Are you suggesting that? there might be something inappropriate oh no sorry that was my see this is why i'm not a published author my word choice is bad yeah yeah i, th I think maybe maybe you're lame okay yeah um, yeah that that sounds pretty accurate yeah can you just, just just get all the way off off my back okay <laughs> ergo nate. ergo nate yeah you fuck so what happened so, with that what happened with that girl he was remembering was that she had been um, like valedictorian candidate. She was straight A student, but she had plagiarized an assignment, and the guilt had gotten to her. And that attitude she had reminds him of the attitude that Neil is giving him right now. Neil is being evasive. Oh He's God. ashamed. 
Did Neil once plagiarize an English paper when he was 16? No, it's got to be something else. Wait, Neil. Have you... Where is the door your idea? Where, where did you guys get the idea for the door? And Neil's just like, uh, yeah, no, um, gotta go stuff. And he leaves. Well, well, first, first, Mike thinks maybe, maybe you got the, did, did you get the deal? Uh, did you get the idea, uh, at like a crossroads with like some sort of demon or like, have you been hanging around with Hitler recently? Did, did Hitler and his scientists give you, uh, give you the inspiration for this door? Do you, uh, do you play blues guitar, Neil? Do you enjoy the music of, uh, Robert Johnson? Hmm? You Nazi bastard. And, uh, and, and Neil, and Neil being a, uh... Disposable? Uh, yeah, I was gonna say a, a poker-faced genius. Oh, uh, okay. He, he manages to slip out very quickly without making eye contact to tell Mike, I've got nothing to hide. And there's nothing wrong about this. <laughs> got nothing to hide. Don't go in my room. <laughs> so Mike starts uh, his shift watching the door with Jamie. And she is being very flirtatious. She's talking to Mike about, uh, is Mike trying to turn her on? And Ooh. during the conversation, the, uh, the cat she had as a child came up and, um, she remembers it having a different name. And she's like, oh my god, did I say his name was Spock? I must have been so drunk. And they get to talking, and Mike opens up and, and tells Jamie that he didn't want to ever do anything with his high IQ or, or his intellectual potential. Because every time you read about a genius scientist who who has this this brain that works in a way that other people's don't they're always just miserable and he doesn't want to be miserable he he just wants to be a normal teach guy high school teach high school to and as you know i i can kind of so i've got to obviously we've been being a little silly i'm i'm coming back to reality here so okay um <laughs> So he he thinks by not uh, there there there's an interesting undercurrent that maybe Mike has the tendency towards like information addiction that if he starts just he he could easily just go on Wikipedia and start reading and never stop and just try to absorb like all the human knowledge there is and if he does that the more knowledge he gains, the more no the more knowledge he'll be able to synthesize and, and process, and his intellect will just become his whole life, which is legitimately an interesting idea. Yes, and never is going to come up again. And no, in fact, the moral of the story is that he should have done that the whole time. Yes, absolutely. And that there's no consequences then for doing that. Yeah, Mike Mike is a man who maxed out the IQ test, but he's an idiot for not using his IQ because there's no consequence to doing so. The thing that killed me is, like, it, it, it's interesting because, like, I, at first I wanted to say that, well, this is, like, those, those people he's talking about, they're not miserable because they used their intellect, they're miserable because their mind works in a way that makes social interactions more difficult. And so it doesn't matter whether they like if Einstein becomes a professor or doesn't become a professor, it's not going to change the fact that he maybe doesn't interpret social cues correctly. But Mike's intellect works in such a way that it could actually be that the more he uses it, the the worse that problem would become because the more information he takes in the more he has to process so if he keeps himself from taking in a ridiculous amount of information he might be able to leave and lead a normal life and it's it was just interesting to me that like oh that could actually that could actually be the case for mike if he 
gives in to this desire to pursue his intellect, he he could make his social relationships harder. And yeah, that's just throw that out, throw that complication out. Mike's awesome. There are no consequences. It's a superpower. By this point, uh, Mike's conversations with Reggie have revealed that Reggie once tried to break the terms of his contract with Arthur. So uh, we glossed over this earlier, but Reggie has mentioned to Mike that they once tried to hack into the project servers and that Ben Miles was there for the specific purpose of figuring out what they're doing. Reggie is just looking for some assurance that Arthur Cross is at least keeping some kind of record of what he's doing and that, you know, if he gets hit by a bus tomorrow or walks through his own invention and dies mysteriously, that um, DARPA's multi-million dollar investment in this will not just be wasted. I'm a little insulted that you would think that the door would kill Arthur. Yeah, and I I didn't want to talk about this a lot the last time because uh, we spent so much time talking about how he would not ever have agreed to this contract with Arthur. I don't care how magical his his door is. Um, so the fact that Reggie is now trying to break the terms of that contract, it why would he have ever agreed to it? I I, I just. Yeah, so we we're not going to go back back down this this rabbit hole. Right. Listen uh, to the first podcast. We we uh we talk about that extensively in the first Yeah. Part. So we're just going to move on from that, but yeah, the, But Reggie is treated like the bad guy for wanting assurance that his project is safe. Yeah, there's and Mike Mike's like you're trying to steal from him and Reggie is like like I own it. Like, I'm paying for this. It's my project. Yeah, he's like, I can't steal it. I bought it. So, right. <laughs> um, the, the only reason I bring this up now is because this is presented in the book as Mike beginning to sympathize with the scientists. I want you to keep in mind, they've killed a person. They previously were in trouble for rushing into animal testing without approval. And they butchered an animal. Now they've butchered a person. And the first thing they did the next day was send another person through without knowing why the first person died. And Mike is sympathizing with the scientists. And their project is currently completely out of their control. I, so, it only yeah. works. It only works if you don't remember the things you read before. Yes, if we we were discussing this earlier, and if you read like one chapter a day or every couple of days, this story makes so much sense. It's a great story, but if you're reading it like a book, or if you do a second read, it does not stand up at all. Or if you were um, supposed to record and you put off reading it for a month and quickly read 200 pages in an afternoon, (laughs) it really jumps out at you. (laughs) So I I was thinking I was going to save this brief discussion until later, but uh, it's going to be very relevant going forward. So I might as well just brief. And it's it's about the the concept of story collapse. So I I actually initially liked this book, but I had some problems, some annoyances, some some nitpicks, and then the more we started discussing it and analyzing it. It, it just got worse and worse and worse. And 
I know that Goodreads reviews don't matter, but I went from like, okay, it's it's easily like three and a half stars. And then it, it went down to three. And then it's down to two. And as we discussed it, shit like the physical <laughs> that the doctor missed the scars, for example, it sticks out now. And it's like, ah, uh, it... So, so I want, I want to talk about story plot. So, I, I didn't actually come up with this. I, I'm plagiarizing here. You're plagiarizing. citing. Well, yeah, way to ruin the joke. I, I'm, I'm citing Seamus Young. He's a writer on The Escapist. Uh, he also has a website, SeamusYoung.com dash, or slash 20 cited. And he talks about story collapse like this. So we're, we're in the primary world reading about the secondary world. And the author's job is to get you invested in the secondary world. And, you know, you can you can suspend your disbelief to a certain extent if you have trust in the author. But, and here's the quote, you keep getting yanked out of the story by things that don't make sense. And the more it happens, the more seriously it happens, the more you stop thinking about what you're seeing now, and the more you find yourself looking back trying to figure out how this can all possibly fit together. If the story is a huge mess, then this sort of reflection will just reveal more problems, and trying to sort out these problems will uncover even more until you have story collapse. And he goes on to say that you you lose you lose any trust you have in the author. And that's what that's Yeah, boy did that happen. Yeah, that perfectly sums up yeah. what what I've got here when I read this book, because the more we went back and we analyzed, the more it's like, oh my God, the physician didn't see the scars and everyone is just sweeping under the rug that they killed a man. And we'll be coming up with more of these examples. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but I wanted everyone to kind of see where I'm coming from. It was so, it was so bad and so lazy i actually went back and thumbed through 14 to see if i remembered it wrong i actually reread 14 for this podcast because i also read another peter klein's book uh x heroes and that was kind of eh like not not great but it's, it's passable and it was his first published story so i could cut him some slack i could but, i could certainly say if this was the story he first shopped for his first novel he would not be a novelist i yes. do i do not think any first time author could sell the fold this is Absolutely. this novel exists solely on the back of x heroes and 14 absolutely yeah, and and calling it sci-fi, I don't know. I'm I'm not going to blame him for that. This is not science fiction. This is not even remotely science fiction. Calling these people scientists is a joke. They do not fulfill any meaningful requirements of being a science. I mean, I imagine one of them owns a lab coat, but that's it. Like. The science is not there. He doesn't talk about it. And when he does talk about it, it's awful. Like, he got a medical examination wrong. He got, a, he got a standard physical wrong. Every single person listening to this podcast, I hope, has had a medical physical at some point. And you know they would detect if all of this... Like, they check you for melanoma. Like, they would detect if you had a mole that changed shape her entire back transformed over like in a second (laughs) she had had she had previously had a physical the last time she walked it's just if you can't even get like the most mundane aspects of the science in your science fiction correct the guy who wrote the martian did a blurb for this Uh, calling it intelligent uh and and awesome and i can only think he either knows peter klein's personally or he was paid to say that (laughs) that that or he rushed through the book because 
because if you rush through the book and you don't really think about it, you don't really process it, I can see how you might just overlook stuff like that. I didn't think about the physical until just now when I was like, oh, you're right. He's seen Jamie's back many, many times. Well, or he should have. She was in the hospital for days. It would have been in her records. Yeah. Yeah. It's It would be impossible like, what the fuck is the point of the physical? If they're looking for changes, the most minute changes, we're doing CT scans. We're going to look for changes in the cells of her brain. And you don't notice her whole fucking torso has changed. They, I mean, it is, it is worth pointing out that they do notice that her, her mental status has changed, her personality, but they all just kind of chalk it up to different things, like, Neil's like, oh, it must have been that doctor's visit. And Mike is thinking that... Everyone well, loves a physical, right? You yeah, feel so Mike refreshed. is thinking that, that Arthur is pimping her out to him. Which is a reasonable assumption. That's that's actually one of the more reasonable things. Like, Absolutely. Like her, At this point, after he saw a man die... Yeah, <laughs> her behavior is so strange. And she's so sexually aggressive... That he thinks Arthur told her to sleep with him to get him on their side. Which, at least he noticed she was acting strange. At least Peter Kleins realized he had to pay lip service to that. As you may have guessed, that is not the case. He, he did not pimp her out. No. So, so let's, Jamie... Let's talk about Jamie. Sexually, sexually aggressive is, the way, is, is a good way of putting it. Because she is... I mean, she went from someone who could not even be touched without storming out of the room to, like, being all over Mike. And she basically forces him to ask her out to dinner, and they don't even make it to dinner. She tries to fuck Mike while they're driving to dinner. Can I just say, so, can I just say something about myself as I was reading this scene? So, they're driving to dinner, right? They're driving to a Mexican place. And I remember that because I was thinking, that sounds good. (laughs) Like authentic Mexican food. I love that. And can I just say, me, Ben, if I was not turned around, I would not have turned around. (laughs) She, she was like, she was like, they're at the place. They're, they're looking for a parking spot. And she's like, she, Hops on his uh, on his lap and is like like tongue kisses his throat, and she's like, "Do you think Arthur put me up to that?" I was like, "No, that's definitely not what it, what a prostitute would do." Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, so I like, and then she's like, "Do you still want to go to dinner?" And I was like, "Well, I mean, we're yeah. there. We're, yeah, we're here. Of, yeah." Like, <laughs> and and also like the drive there is described in such detail, it seems like it took him a while to get there. So it's like, yeah, no, I kind of do, actually. Yeah, like... <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be hungry later, yeah, okay? We is... don't eat now. And so they don't eat, which frustrated me. More yes. Than... I will admit, that is a nitpick. That frustrated me more than it should have. I, I guess a, a thinner, more sexually active person... <laughs> 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 like, might have uh, might might sympathize uh, with this more, but I was, I, I was like, man, authentic Mexican food, like, <laughs> sex can wait, okay. <laughs> you'll you'll probably still be horny after. This. Let's let's go. Oh my god, you you ever have like a good mole? Oh, I can honestly say I probably have it. I've probably had some some pretty below average mole. Have you ever had mole? I think I have. I don't think you have. I'm pretty sure I've had. I okay. Maybe. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> All right. All right. So so. I I was just gonna let you you talk about this uh, because the oh next dear. part. It it deals with with Mike. He he notices her back, despite never seeing the scarred back. 
he notices that she, in fact, has no scars uh, post coitus. Oh. <laughs> I had to throw that in. So is that how it's so, pronounced? I don't. No. Okay. <laughs> no, not at all. I, I, that was I, so awkward. It made me doubt everything I knew about sex. <laughs> So, so uh, the next part deals with this revelation. Can I read what you wrote? Oh, sure. <laughs> Please do. So we have like some notes and, and a little bit of scripted material we go over in these podcasts. And no, I want you to read this because it's not going to sound right coming from me. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Jamie makes... Mike asks her out to dinner. They don't even make it, though. Jamie tries to fuck Mike while they're driving. They end up back at her place. They take it to the bone zone. I hope you appreciate that I'm the one saying this, Ben. That's in the script. (laughs) That is in the script. And it, it needs to be stated, I am a medical professional. So Mike notices she doesn't have scars, and he's like, what about your scars? And she's like, the fuck are you talking about? I don't have scars. She's, he's like, the motorcycle accident. And she's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And that is when Mike realizes what the door actually does. Or perhaps what not eating Mexican food actually does. We don't know it's the door yet. That's true. It could, it could be, be anything. anything. It could be anything. So, so no, I'm going to go. So they, okay. All right. But I just want to say that the reason I really wanted you to do this is because I couldn't come up with the words I really wanted to describe everything that happens. And I think I settled on the word gross. And you just did such a phenomenal, just a way better job than I did at... <laughs> at accurately depicting what comes next. So I'm going to turn okay. it over to you. Yeah. So let's keep in mind that Mike, um, Mike had in one of the more um, well-crafted scenes in the book, Jamie and Mike previously at the bar had talked about, you know, Jamie's emotional pain and all the things that were wrong with her. And, and Mike tried to reassure her that, you know, she was still a, a talented, beautiful woman and all this stuff. And, um, now he's realizing that the Jamie he had been talking to is might might not be the Jamie he's just been with. So that sparks the ants to realize what many antless readers may have already guessed. The Albuquerque door doesn't actually transport people from place to place mike realizes that the albuquerque door is in fact replacing people with near exact duplicates from a parallel dimension usually the differences are so minute that no one including the replaced person ever notices but every once in a while you get a bob And because this is going to turn into something of a giant plot hole, I think it's important (laughs) to quote the book exactly regarding Mike's explanation of how the door works. And I'm, I'm going to tell you right now that the only way that this is not a plot hole is if Mike is wrong about everything he's about to say. He's just straight up wrong. Because that's not how it works. So this is how he describes it working. And I believe this is what we are supposed to, like, this is how Klein's envisioned it working. So, Mike says, and I quote, I don't know enough about the physics of it to explain it technically. He held up his hands and moved the left one toward the right. This is more of a thought experiment. When we open the door, subject A steps through the rings into a quantum state that we'll call X. An alternate reality, for lack of a better term. Subject A enters this other reality and knocks AX, his or her alternate self, out through the other rings 
into our reality. His left hand tapped against his right, and it moved off, continuing the path. A goes in. AX comes out. End quote. So now, to paraphrase a little bit, what Mike is saying is that when you enter the ring, the rings then find a, a, a match for you in an alternate reality, and they pop that match out. So Bob went in, and I'll, we don't know where Bob went. We think maybe Bob went to, to post-apocalyptic Bob's future. But when Bob went in, he knocked post-apocalyptic Bob out the other side. And keep that in mind. That's how this is described as working. He's able to prove this to the group by showing the group Jamie's distinct lack of scars. That is a mind-blowing moment for the group. They finally all realize that, oh my god, the door didn't do what they think. And then they very quickly have to reckon with the fact that since each of them has gone through the door multiple times, this is not the reality that they were born into. And that all of them have life experiences that, well, nearly identical to their current reality's counterpart, they are different in some ways. And this is especially complicated for Mike and Jamie, because as I stated, the, the budding relationship between Mike and Jamie was cut short by the fact that now they are different people. That is not the Jamie, or that is not the Jamie that Mike fell in love with, and that is not the Mike that this Jamie was hitting on. So, Jamie in this reality, Mike's reality, was deeply insecure about her looks. She's told us that she's had a complicated sex life. She has had many partners reject her because they were turned off by her scars. She's dealing with the trauma of a, dis of a disfiguring injury and the emotional rejection of multiple romantic partners. So the relationship that was blossoming between Jamie and Mike was far from romance in our reality, in my opinion. But Absolutely, I agree with that. But given time, I could have seen, like, given time, say, to the end of the book, I right. could have seen a romance develop. I could have seen this book end with a kiss or a hug. But where they were at the bar was not romance. It was just trust. She trusted Mike with her secrets. So she was opening up. And trust can turn into romance, but it wasn't there yet. So she has trauma. Trauma that it seemed like Mike was willing to work with. And that maybe he could have been the guy to help her regain some of that lost self-esteem. He could see her inner beauty and accept her for who she was, injury and all. And that, that could have been a beautiful relationship. Now, if you're like me, you might be thinking that well, maybe they're going to try to go get get the, the, the other people back, or maybe they're going to try to put people back in the realities they're supposed to be in. No. That's not what's happening. When you switch, you switch, you can't go back. Um, so the book is going in a very different direction with the romance. So the new Jamie struggles a bit with accepting her place in this new reality. She's worried that she's uh, not as good as the old Jamie, that she's not going to be able to give as much to the team. She's not going to be as intelligent. And she's sure that the old Jamie would have been able to help them figure out what went wrong with their now always on door. And Mike's response to the new Jamie is um, hashtag problematic. And again, because I find it problematic... I think it's most fair to explain this using the book's own words. So you could judge for yourself. I'm going to quote exactly. Jamie. And the only damn thing I can think of is that I'm not smart enough to figure this out, but she'd probably know the answer. She? Jamie smacked the quarter out of the air with two fingers and it clattered onto her workstation. The one who had the cat named Spock. The one who's supposed to be here. The, the real one. He shrugged. 
Now you're not that different. You know, you're really not good at this whole comforting thing, are you? You're just supposed to hug me, maybe squeeze my butt, and... Well, no, not different in the important ways, said Mike. The Jamie I met, the one who was here before you, she could be a little bitter. I think she thought that the motorcycle crash was the defining moment in her life. That it was why she ended up working with computers rather than doing, I don't know, something else. I think she regretted it sometimes, like she'd been forced down a path instead of having a choice. Yeah? Yeah. But you didn't have the crash, and you still went into computers. You still decided using your mind was the best way to go in life, because that's who you are. She swept the quarter and flipped it into the air again. I take it back, she said. You're better at this than I thought. End quote. And I could be being overly sensitive here. But my first impression upon reading that was it seems so much like he's telling her that she's a better version of herself. Her trauma and pain in the trauma and pain of the previous Jamie um, made her bitter, resentful and regretful. But this Jamie proves that the accident was not the defining moment of her life. And while that seems like a good thing to say on the surface, like that, that's something the old Jamie needed to hear. Like, it would have been great if the old Jamie could have seen the current Jamie and realized that she, she, she had that choice and she made that choice and she'd have made it again in different circumstances. Like, there's, there's not even a line about Mike wishing he could have shown Jamie how little impact the accident had had on her life. The old Jamie is just abandoned. And because they're different people like having a traumatic accident can really shape who you are it, it it shouldn't define you but you know we kind of are our experiences and so the old jamie the character that mike was falling in love with the person mike was falling in love with i guess was just she's gone now she's to him she's dead basically <laughs> like she's not coming back i hope she's okay wherever she wound up but we, but Mike never even thinks about it. He doesn't think about where she wound up. He doesn't think about her again. He's got a new Jamie now. He's got a better Jamie now. One without all that trauma. One he doesn't have to go through all that stuff with. He doesn't have to work with her. You know, you're you you're her without her damage, which is awesome. Like, and all that damage has been replaced with the desire to fuck a lot. Yeah, and, and you like me so much more. This is great. And it's like, you know, the, the, this was even true in 14. And like the male gaze is very strong in Peter Klein's writing. And I'm a straight guy. I don't mind depictions of attractive women. But there's just a few times in this book where it really crosses the line. This was one of them. It's, it's like, it's fine for your main character to recognize that a woman is attractive. It's fine for your ignorant male protagonist to describe women based on their looks. It's not fine when that girl is, you know, an underage student of your protagonist. Then it's a little weird. But, for you know, like for the most part, I didn't mind him describing the secretary as being, uh, you know, token hot secretary. I didn't mind him describing Jamie as being sexy computer babe. Like, I didn't mind Bruce Campbell describing Renee Zellweger as, as being super hot. It became a problem when he basically doesn't care that she's a different person now. Or right. at worst, best case scenario, he doesn't care. Worst case scenario, he thinks it's an improvement. Right. He's happy about this. She, she, all these characters around Mike are objects that serve Mike. They serve his fantasies. And I'm not just talking about Jamie. I'm talking about Olaf and Arthur and everything. They're all one-dimensional because Mike is the only person in his reality, in this reality. Reggie's just the best friend. 
Reggie's relationship is defined by Reggie's whole character is defined by his relationship to Mike. Everybody's character is defined by their relationship to Mike. They don't have interactions with each other. They have interactions with Mike. And so he's, he's not just objectifying Jamie. He's objectifying the entire cast, but it's the most disgusting with Jamie. We, we actually debated initially whether we should bring this up or not, but we both arrived at this same conclusion without even discussing the book in detail. And so we realized that if we arrived at this conclusion, probably other people who read this book also did. So we should bring this up and we should discuss it. I also want to, I want to mention, uh, Dead Moon, the next loosely tied book in this series. Also by Pierre Klein's, obviously. I have no intention to read this, so know that this comes from a position of ignorance on the book. But I read a review that says that the main character, who is a woman, she wanted to be a ballerina, but she couldn't because her boobs were too big, her hips were too wide, but she was also model level hot. And I talked to my friend who had read the book and he he kind of confirmed that that was true i'm not trying to go on a crusade uh, like a like a feminist crusade here but it's like we read that bruce campbell book and there's a lot of things that like if you're very sensitive to these kinds of issues um you've probably found a lot more problems in books we've read that we haven't mentioned. And that's why I pointed out, you know, my tolerance for the male gaze, I'm, I'm a male. The male gaze probably appeals to me. Like I, I have a higher tolerance for that than some people. And I totally could understand if you like the line for you, is different than the line for me. I draw the line at replacing the old Jamie. Like, I don't mind stories where the guy, where the hero gets the girl in the end cliched and, and outdated as that may sometimes be. And I wouldn't have minded if this was a story where, uh, Mike got the girl in the end, but really up until this point, up until the bar scene, there was no romantic plot, in this book at all. And there didn't need to be. And he shoehorns it in, in the laziest, grossest, just juvenile. Yeah. Juvenile way possible. And he has thrown logic out the window time and time again in this book. You know, the consequences for actions are so inconsistent. They break with what would happen in reality. So many times, I guess we're, we're now dealing with, infinite parallel universes which is sort of the thread that loosely ties all the threshold series together he can do whatever random nonsense he wants because anything can happen because we're in infinite parallel universes i don't even know if the reality mike is in is the same as my reality maybe that's why you can yell at a senator and not be held in contempt of congress in this reality. So he can explain everything away he wants. It's not a gritty realistic book. And he could have gone in any direction. So obviously, like we pointed out, this is not hardcore sci-fi. This is not sci-fi at all. Other than he adopts the aesthetic of sci-fi, like there are machines and there are scientists and there is funding but nobody ever does science. There's no real theories going on here. There's no real like discussions of like, what if this technology existed? It's just the aesthetic of science fiction. So when you could do whatever you want and you can have it be this light fun novel, like 14 was 14 was a light fun novel that occasionally had moments where it got a little real because the characters had to feel feelings. But he could do whatever he wants and he could have gotten the old Jamie back. He could have not had Mike get attached to Jamie at all. He could have not 
done that. Like, what boggles my mind is he he made it worse than it needed to be. Why make Jamie this emotionally and physically scarred character who opens up to Mike to replace her with a hotter nympho? Why do that? I just don't get it. Why give her that kind of depth? Why make it that kind of adult romance? And then yank it away to be like a 16-year-old's fantasy, like comic book romance. It's just like juvenile, gross. I, I don't know what the right word is. It's it's baffling because I don't think he's like a bad person. I just don't understand his choices at all. And I can think of just half a dozen better ways to write it. And even just acknowledging Mike missing the old Jamie in some way would have made him less of a bastard. Like, I just like Mike so much less now. But I don't know. Are you are you ready to move on from the Jamie issue? Because I don't know that there's... You also a... like Peter Klein's a lot less now, too. I, I don't get him. <laughs> like, honest, honest to God, the more I think about the book, I, I've... I wanted to say lazy. This isn't even a case of laziness because he did more than he had to. And it was worse. Like he didn't have to give Jamie that depth. Right. I don't know why he did. Cause it makes, it makes it worse. So this isn't a case of him being lazy. There are cases of him being lazy and taking story shortcuts like the, the physical exams, but even the physical exams, like why did they even do physical exams? Why even say that if you're not paying attention to it? That's what I don't understand. Is he just filling pages, just typing whatever pops into his head as he thinks about it, and then he never went back and reread it? No editor found this. I don't know that's, how this. I don't know how this book got published. Happened. I don't know how it got published. There's no. We've said this before about other books, like they need an editor. I don't know how this got published. I know how it got published. 14 was great, and they said, yeah, let's just do more of that, but, like, that's it. Just more of that and, like, the worst parts of 14. Uh, this is this is the one time. You, you, you joke advertise our book all the time, <laughs> and this is the one book we have read where I am comfortable saying, I would rather read our book. Absolutely. <laughs> that is possibly the most offensive thing I can say. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I used to say, I have read our book more than any other book, and I hate it the most of any book I've read. <laughs> and now it's like, do you know, this is the thing that, that kills me is, we self-published. We don't, you know, we never really cared if anybody read the book. We were doing it for ourselves. We were doing it to practice, to get better. We didn't try to shop it around to publishers because we knew it wasn't good enough. It wasn't refined enough. It, there, there were inconsistencies and plot holes and things like that. So we self-published it on the off chance anybody ever wanted to read it. And it, it let us throw it on our Kindles and everything and say, like, oh, buy our book. But available on Amazon, by the way. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> it is. It, these are facts. Um, so, Go on. <laughs> but we didn't shop it around to publishers because we knew it wasn't good enough. And even then, how many times have each of us read our book cover to cover, editing the hell out of it? We met up in person for a week you you slept on my couch and went over that book and edited it and talked about like what needed changed what needed added all this stuff and i cannot imagine that happened with the fold i cannot imagine there was a second draft no i think he uh he unearthed his college draft and then he just said oh okay i'll take some of the stuff that worked in 14 and some of the stuff that you know, was bad. And I'm just going to staple it on there. Yeah. I, I, and that was one of the fun things I tried to do while I was reading. It was like, what was in the original story? Like what, what existed before 
he decided to make it part of the threshold universe. And I think I know. So Mike's explanation of how the portal works. I'm going to say that was from the original story. I think so, too, because that's not at all how the portal works. Yeah. I'm going to guess in the original college draft, the portal started expanding and they had to destroy it. And yes. destroying it was the end. Yes. And I think that's all that happened. And yeah. that would have been yeah. a fine right. thing for this book. But then it would have had absolutely no connection to 14. And we can't have that. I really think what happened... I think you're right. I think the the publisher was like, hey, 14 was was really good. Uh, really really well-received, well-reviewed. And um, do you... Do you want to do a sequel? We could sell a sequel. And he was like, um, I don't know if it was a deadline thing or if he just didn't have an idea for a sequel. Or he, he just was like, you know, the fold did some stuff with dimensional bullshit. Yeah, yeah, that could do it. Some of the ideas that I think every person who's listening to this podcast, if you've ever dabbled in writing, especially like in high school or college, you'll know that you have these ideas and these characters and these tropes and powers and and situations and that you might incorporate them into a draft of a story and it's not very good or something. And then like some of the ideas in in Eden, for example, like the idea of ether. Um, I had an idea for like, I don't know, urban fantasy magic stuff. And it went through a couple of iterations, like the character of Dave, obviously, you know, I'll admit that's like baby's first OC. He's existed in a couple of different forms and a couple of different ideas I've had. And finally, Eden was the one where that came out. And I think that's what happened with the fold. He wrote it in college and he had this idea for, I want to do stuff with uh, parallel universes. I like parallel universes. And, we'll, and, and what if there was like... I don't know, like HP Lovecraft stuff in parallel universes. And he wrote a story that kind of dealt with that in college and his professor tore it apart and he put it away. And eventually a lot of those ideas got refined and recycled into 14. And maybe some of them even got refined and recycled into X heroes. I don't know. Cause certainly Mike's brain is a superpower and not at all how intelligence works. So we're going to move on. We're going to move on from Jamie. I don't like it. Uh, it's probably very apparent at this point that I don't like this book. <laughs> I, <laughs> I have a lot of problems with it. Um, yeah. And, and I gradually liked it less and less and less as more shit just started piling up. Like I said, it's a uh, I hope story collapse. Yeah. I mean, if, if we can do anything with this podcast, I hope it's that I can take things that were fine that you enjoyed and uh, suck that joy right back out of your life. <laughs> if I'm glad that this book gave you a moment's pleasure and I was able to undo that. Well, he wrote the fold a year after 14 or published it. I should say, wow. I wasn't. Really? Gonna... Yeah. I actually 11 months. I think the Maybe. fold, the fold should have stayed a short story. Yes. There, there's just not enough here trying to make it, into a like all these one dimensional characters would have worked fine in a short story. Like Reggie gives you the quest and then you go on the quest and then there's a bunch of people and you try to figure out what's happening and Oh, they're frauds. <laughs> oh, sorry. Spoiler. We didn't get there yet. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't figure it out, these guys are idiots. Um, <laughs> they're, they're the world's least convincing <laughs> scientists. <laughs> and, I loved that. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that right now. We'll, we'll talk about a, that. It makes a lot of sense uh, once the reveal happens. You're like, oh, that's why they're also stupid. Yeah, that's why. Oh my god, they weren't real scientists. I should have known. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, you got me. All right, so let's let's forge ahead where Mike is explaining. He explained all this to the other scientists who we just established are all a bunch of incompetent morons. So, after the revelation that they are all from parallel universes, 
uh, Olaf, of all people, has had enough, and he finally says he's, they're they're going to come clean. Was that a way to try and make Olaf a little more endearing? Because he's a lot less of a dick at this point in the book and going forward. I I don't know. I I don't know. I have no idea what he was going for with any of the characters who are not Mike, Jamie, Reggie. All right, continue. So the the group had come together to research teleportation. And after their failure to create a functioning teleportation system and the questionable ethics violation that led to their censure, uh, they decided they needed to buy some time for the scandal to blow over. They didn't want their project to end in the murder of a dog. So they wanted to buy some time for everybody to forget about that. And they came up with the idea of the Albuquerque door. The door was loosely based on actual science, though they had no idea how to make it work. They stalled for as much time as possible, and they managed to delay Reggie for 14 months, which points to maybe Reggie not being very good at his job. (laughs) Yeah, uh, maybe Reggie's also a little incompetent. Yeah, like you got one thing you're supposed to, like for 14 months, these guys did absolutely nothing. I think I would get fired if I did nothing for a day. Yeah, so I'm going to quote directly from the book again. We managed to hold off Magnus for 14 months. By the way, Reggie's last name is Magnus. And then he demanded to see something. Some scrap of proof that we were making progress. If not, he wasn't going to renew our funding. And we had nothing. We'd constructed the rings, the the whole system. But without the equations to make it all work, it was just a powerful, very expensive electromagnet. We'd hit the end of our careers. Now, I got a quick question for you, Nate, um, because this, uh, I'm a math person, and this bothered me. (laughs) Oh, yes. Did it ever bother you? (laughs) Do you think he knows what an equation is? Because, (laughs) and I want to remind you, because this is a, a Stephen Hawking esque scientist in the form of arthur cross speaking to a mycroft holmes level savant one would get the impression that arthur thinks equations are magic spells that you speak before a circle of science and things happen that is absolutely what peter klein seems to think an equation is it's it's the science equivalent of magic uh he we're gonna keep bringing up 14 because it's the one good example that we have of peter Klein's, and it's so tied to this in terms of everything really so he did something similar in 14 uh and it worked a lot better there because it wasn't a super scientist and a guy who broke the iq test over his back it was a bunch of dudes of average intellect who came across a machine, they had no idea how it worked, and it was essentially just magic, and they didn't have to try to explain anything with equations and all this other yerbal verbal nonsense. I don't want to give away too much of 14, I guess, but there's also something in 14 that there's a construct, shall we say, in 14. And the people who stumble upon it realize, like... It's weird, and they don't know how it works. And that makes sense, because why would they? They didn't build it. These guys built a science circle without knowing, like, what does the gate, what does the ring do? Because he keeps, so I think the one time they mentioned it, it was something like, I built a machine that tells the universe, I'm putting my foot down here, and then I do it. It's like, that. okay, but that's... What does it do? Does it, like... How does it tell the universe that? Like, does it send out 
signals? Does it send it, out like electro? It, it uses an electromagnetic pulse, and using the equations that he feeds into this ring, it fires math at the universe, and the universe is temporarily confused. And says, I guess that makes sense. Your foot would go over there instead of over here. And that's how it works. Uh, okay. We're <laughs> getting the universe drunk. So I'm going uh, to... Let, let's talk about... Temporarily. Let's talk about how they found the equations. Maybe that was a slip of the tongue. Okay. Maybe, maybe equation was the wrong word. Maybe... Um, I don't know how you could build the rings... <laughs> They built rings that they didn't know they were going to need. Yeah, I don't know how you could build rings without knowing what they were supposed to do. So let's say my brain is trying to fill in the gaps, okay? And I'm struggling. So the rings do something. They, so I, in my mind, and I have no reason to believe this other than that he said it was an electromagnet. In my mind, the rings generate a signal. They send out some kind of, of wave or or pulse uh, i guess so so they generate electromagnetic waves and the equations would would somehow tell you what specific waves should be generated so they built like like a radio a big one okay <laughs> so only Stephen My Hawking could do that. Bigger than yours. <laughs> well, they built a really big radio. Okay, so that's 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 what I think is happening here. And I could be totally wrong because I have very little to go on. So they built these rings to send out a signal. They suspected if they sent the right signal that the universe would fold in half, which is reasonable, I guess. Maybe I don't know. Um, I haven't tried talking to the universe myself. So at this point. Olaf, Arthur, and the team have these rings. They don't do anything, and they're out of time. So they get spectacularly drunk. And while they're getting drunk, they were all talking about how they were going to go down in history as a bunch of crackpot pseudoscientists. And considering that up until this point, their only achievement is having spent hundreds of millions of dollars to build the world's largest, cruelest method of murdering a dog... I would say that they should probably just cut their losses because that's what they are. Hey, maybe they'll get lucky and no one will remember them. That's probably the best possible scenario. Yeah, they're, they're not good scientists. So Arthur is inspired by the uh, idea of crackpot scientists. And he remembers the work of a man he came across during his research for a book on the history of physics. And this man's name is Alexander Kotorovic. And he was active in the fields of neuroscience and biochemistry in the 1880s. And Kotorovic's theories were so bizarre and nonsensical that Arthur didn't even want to include them in his book. And yet... And yet, he has the book... Um, and the ideas that he had are the thing that makes the ring work. Obviously. So Kotorovic dabbled in all sorts of science, and his conclusions uh, were that humanity was one day going to form a kind of collective telepathic consciousness. And that consciousness would somehow open a dimensional breach between worlds. And that the monsters of those worlds would be attracted by our succulent human meats, and they would devour us. And Kotorovic, uh, don't ask me what this means, but somehow had a lot of math to back up his theories. And Sasha, Sasha I'm sorry, suggested that perhaps they should just put in the uh, put in his equations to the door. And Jamie says, Arthur read off 37 pages of equations, and I typed it all in. And for me, um, this is what I imagine it must be like for you to hear that someone will be uh, not doing vaccinations for their child and using essential oils instead. <laughs> 
So here's the thing about equations. Equations aren't programs. They're not algorithms. They are statements. They are statements that the values of two mathematical expressions are equal. So let's say, for example, force equals mass times acceleration. The force that an object can apply is equal to its mass times its acceleration. That is a statement. It is a relationship between force and mass and acceleration. So if you typed in F equals MA into a C++ IDE, and we know they're using C++ because he made sure to tell us, and then you hit run, you would get an error because you didn't define any of those variables. And also, you didn't say what to do with F once you calculated it. And where did you get M and A? So these are things you would need to know. If you wanted to write a program that like calculated the force of an object, you would need to uh, find the object's mass, and you would need to find uh, how fast it was accelerating. And I guess you would read those from instruments of some kind. So you would need code that got the values from the instruments. And then you would do your calculation and you would have force and you would need some code that did something with the result of that calculation. I guess display it to a screen. So you would need to write some code to display it if that's what you wanted to do. Um, or in this case, I guess you would want to say like generate pulse or something. If I generously assume that she isn't doing what they're saying she's doing in the book, that she's not literally just typing in 37 pages of some guy's random equations, which I'm guessing look like F equals MA equals integral, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Like in a world before computer programming. Y yeah. So she's just typing in equations and the variables, d do they know what they are? Uh, do they know what they mean? Like, does, does Kotorovic define what what his variables are? Like, what the values he's equating actually mean? May, maybe he does. It's interesting that, like, for example, some of those values must be the number of human minds that exist. And, and we find out later that, indeed, that is a very important factor to how this doorway works. And also, it would have to take into account the the rings themselves, and I'm glad you pointed this out to me as well, would have to be built to somehow take in the psychic energy of how take in power it. Well, yeah, and th so this is... I'm guessing they, they talk about signals. <laughs> like, the human mind does give off an electromagnetic field um we do generate signals oh there you go perfect so when there's enough of them it vibes with the ring and the ring does stuff different i have no idea what she could have possibly typed in from this book that affects her rings because if you have equations you have variables like so F equals MA is describing the relationship between quantities. And it's just, it's true of all objects. So if you say F equals MA, you're trying to say like for an object, it's mass times its acceleration will equal the force it can generate. So the reason you would write that and not just like 50 Newtons is because you want to generalize it to all objects. So Kotorovic's equations must have something to do with the number of people and the, you know, electromagnetism in an area and the, the state, like he's describing variables. So she types in these variables. And so when the conditions change, the, the values change and, and, and such, this isn't what an equation is. <laughs> like, like I just, I can't fill in this gap. And I'm guessing another person just just glossed over this because, ah, okay, computers, bullshit, programs, whatever. But I know 
what equations are. I know how algorithms work. Oh, uh, yeah. So that really bothered me. Olaf also mentions that so they don't understand the equations. That this is this is what it's going to come out to be. So Olaf mentions that some of the equations are unfinished and I don't understand <laughs> what the fuck they typed into this computer. If the equations aren't finished, if you don't understand the equations, like, I'm going to need you to be more specific. What is it about the equations that you don't understand? Because How did it work if it was unfinished? How did it work if... Well, it didn't, I guess. Because it's not doing what they thought it did. Uh, like, how did you build a machine to take in input you didn't know you were going to give it? How did you type... How did you convert the equations into an algorithm... If you didn't know what they did, like, do you at least know what the values are supposed to be? And right. so if you didn't, like, is that what they don't understand? Do they not know what the variables actually represent? Or do they know what the variables represent, but they don't know? You're, you're supposed to fill it in because Peter Klein's won't. But if, what don't they know? I guess that's what I that's what I need to know. Is, they don't know anything. <laughs> why we fucking idiots? Why don't they why don't they understand the machine? They they spent 14 months building a gate that they didn't know they were going to need simply as a prop to say, "Hey, look, we're we're making some progress on this teleportation door. Just keep funneling money into us." Yeah, but like why don't they get it? I, I guess that's my problem. Is so it comes out that they've been studying. So they they type these equations in, and the machine just magically worked. And they 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 cast their magic spell and and in their magic portal, and then the magic portal worked. And the all they've been doing since that is trying to figure out how it works because they don't understand. But what what don't they understand? You have the equations. You obviously understood them enough to program them. You obviously understood them enough to build a machine that could use them. So what's missing? If you know what all the variables are and you have the equations and you have a machine that can do something with those equations, what's the disconnect? And it seems like the disconnect is that they're like, well, Kotorovic went on about all this bullshit about psychic energy and monsters and blah, 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 blah. But it's like... You typed that in, though. <laughs> and so now you know... He was it. right. <laughs> so he was right. And so now you know that psychic energy is real. And it has effects. And that all the science that says it wasn't real is wrong. I, it's magic. So I thought of a way to make this better. Yes, you did. So my idea would have been... That they they thought that their electromagnet would be able to fold space time, and they built it, and it just they couldn't make it work. But they found this old stupid book in a bookshop, and the old stupid book they they bought it because they're like, oh hey, this guy says he knows how to make portals to different places. Wouldn't that be neat? Maybe we should name something after him. And so uh, in the book, it has this ritual for like lighting a bunch of candles and like, you know, cutting your hand and putting some blood in it or whatever. And they got drunk one night and they decided, yeah, fuck it. We're just going to try the ritual. And they try the ritual and oh my God, it creates a portal. And they don't want to admit that they did some occult magical bullshit to make a portal. And they, they, they're scientists. So there must be some scientific explanation for why that ritual worked. So they, they pretended that their electromagnet was creating the portal every time they used it, but in reality, they, they were doing the ritual every time. And the more they did the ritual, the more they engaged in black magic they didn't understand, and now things are out of control. And there was no scientific explanation, because it was, it was just fucking magic. And, and that's why they didn't talk to anybody. But in reality, that's, it, it was science with math and equations and everything, so Mike asks a pretty good question. Which is, why didn't you just say something and get more people involved to help you understand this new discovery that you, you, you weren't equipped to deal with? Arthur took a deep breath and he sighed. 
pride, he said. Ego. We were so sure we could crack it and then too embarrassed that we couldn't. Suddenly we'd go from being the people who created the Albuquerque door to a footnote, Olaf said. We'd just be the people who laid the groundwork for someone else to figure it out. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, said Mike. You don't publish a lot, do you, smirked Olaf. You know how no one remembers Isaac Newton after Einstein did relativity? You know, scientific discoveries made by accident, like the guy who made penicillin and then uh, presented his finding and a bunch of people like were like, oh my God, this is amazing. And they refined it and they made better antibiotics. And I don't buy that ex explanation of science for a fucking minute. Okay, so Ko Kotorovic may be vindicated, but you guys are still the ones that built the fucking door. You don't know fully why it works, but like... Isaac Newton didn't fully know why gravity was a thing, and also I think we still don't, but he gets a lot of credit for doing stuff with gravity. Sorry, hold on, back up. Isaac who? Oh, Who's yeah, right. Guy? Yeah, the guy who laid the groundwork for Albert Einstein, who laid the groundwork for Stephen Oh, yeah, Hopkins. that loser. That's yeah. right. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's idiots no one knows about. Um, Peter Klein knows nothing about scientific publication, because... People who publish a lot publish random bullshit all the time. Absolutely. Every grad student I know is doing a study on, like, do oranges taste better at midnight? I don't know. <laughs> Let me design an experiment. Do they, though? Yes. Shit, let's... Let's publish. Test <laughs> <laughs> no, people, people publish shit... All the time. <laughs> like, this, their, their discoveries here would totally be worth publishing. And you would publish more than one thing. You would publish and people would reproduce your experiment and you would get credit for it and you could bring other people on. You could, you could publish your theories about why you think it works. Or, and you could delve more deeply into Kotorovic and you could, you could realize he had all these insights into this and people could find more of his work. And it would be like a scientific method. And we can't have that. No, because they're scientists. They're not acting like scientists. They're acting like CEOs who pay scientists who want to keep the formula for Coke to themselves. Well, hold on. Hold on. If we use your method, though, they could not mouth off to a senator and an Air Force general or whatever. Yeah, they wouldn't need to. Yeah, that's that's a problem. Because uh, they'd, they'd already have their that. money. <laughs> they'd already have their money, and they'd already have their Nobel Prize. You know, maybe maybe the reason why they didn't publish the experiment is because it makes no sense, and they had no idea how they were going to write down. We put equations into a computer, and an electromagnet managed to somehow rip a door in space time. I would simply publish that I created this device that does something. And we were looking for the proper um, set of parameters. Like, we were looking for the proper parameters to put in to generate the frequency that causes the fold. And we found um, a set of equations that produces the correct values which to use as parameters in our machine, which is how he should have described it, by the way. So when we use these equations to derive our parameters, we typed them in, and my God, it worked. And it turned out that what we were not accounting for was human psychic energy. When you account for the energy generated by the human brain, the whole thing works. My God, I discovered the existence of a soul. Damn, he could probably get a religion out of this. Yes, and I would present that and say, here's how you build a machine. I mean, maybe you can't build it because it's like the specs are owned by DARPA. That's national security. You can't build it. But if you build a machine that accepts these parameters and does something with them, you too can have an Albuquerque door. Fair warning, though. I've killed at least one person doing this. <laughs> 
fair warning. That's that's good. I jumped to and the conclusion. Also, and also the uh, the information, the the source where I got these equations from men- mentioned uh, murder monsters from another dimension that will eat all of us. So you know, just bear in mind that hasn't happened yet, but maybe question mark. So we haven't done our Lovecraft episode yet, <laughs> but when we do, um, when uh, N- Nate, have you ever read any Lovecraft? I think, uh, no, I don't think I have. Perfect. I think I may have seen bits and pieces, but I've never read. Perfect. Are you familiar with the Necronomicon? I am familiar with it. Okay, a lot of, everybody's heard of the Necronomicon. So, in Lovecraft stories, for anyone who doesn't know, all the Lovecraft stories also kind of take place in a shared universe. Most of them do, at any rate. And in that universe, there exists a book. And there are only like four copies of the book. It is called the Necronomicon. And it is recorded as having been written by, I'm not going to use all Lovecraft's language for it, but um, Abdul Alhazred. And he was something of a mage. And he records in this book all the all the various like deities of, of the Lovecraft universe. And there are incantations and spells to summon them. And he warns of all the consequences of summon them. And he talks about all the the dreamlands and everything. And Kotorovic is essentially a one-to-one correlation for Abdul Alhazred. And his treatise is the Necronomicon. And what these guys did was they took something from the Necronomicon. They put it in their magic portal and it does stuff. And I'm guessing that is not in the original short story because Mike literally just described some quantum fluctuation improbability drive stuff. And what they immediately go to is it's not that it's a portal. So the door is like a portal to other dimensions or something. And Mike realizes pretty quickly Oh, this is such a mess. <laughs> <laughs> because they go back and forth, I'm realizing now. It goes back yes, and forth about what it does. Sometimes it's a portal, <laughs> and sometimes it's an anomaly that changes things in the vicinity. Sometimes yeah. it affects an object, sometimes it doesn't affect an object. Sometimes, as you pointed out, site A looks into site B in the same dimension, and sometimes it looks into site B of a different dimension. Olaf mentions later that one time they were running the test and Sasha had different colored hair. However, earlier in the book, he was playing baseball or catch with Bob through the portal. They didn't open the portal and see a hellscape and creepy radioactive Bob lurching towards them. They saw regular Bob. He walked through and a different guy came out. You're right. Okay. So there's two devices. Sometimes. So, yes. the, the, okay, the Albuquerque door, it, it does two things. And they're not the same thing, but they are presented as the same thing. So, sometimes the Albuquerque door functions as what I'm going to call the original story. And sometimes the Albuquerque door functions as what I'm going to call the threshold version. So, the original Albuquerque door is sort of like a quantum field generator. And when you pass through it you get a different quantum outcome. So when Bob passed through it, he, a quantum Bob from another universe popped out. And so sometimes that's what it does. So sometimes it generates a quantum field that swaps objects with other versions of their, of the objects that come from a parallel universe. So like sometimes you have a quarter from the state of New York and that quarter is sitting on a table. And as the field, if it goes through the field, that quarter transforms into a quarter from the state of New Amsterdam, which is not a real state. For our, Thank you for clarifying. For our that. foreign listeners. So, <laughs> I can't name all the Canadian provinces, I'll tell you that. So, that's, yeah. So, the, the doorway, sometimes it's a door, and sometimes it's a field, and sometimes it's a portal. So, such a quarter is spotted. So, they left a quarter on a table, or they threw it or something, and... Uh, at one second, it was a quarter from New York, 
And the next second, it was a quarter from New Amsterdam. And that makes Mike realize that the field or the doorway or whatever is expanding. It is and no... it affects objects at random. Yeah, yeah, it is no longer contained within the rings. And so... <laughs> I think my brain broke. Um... Yeah, it's, it's a mess. Okay. It basically, the the portal or the field, it changes all the time to whatever Peter Kleins wants it to be at that moment. There are rules, but the rules always change, so there might as well not be rules. Well, there exists... Okay, so my, my brain's filling in the gaps like you're supposed to. So there's... Right. So it started off, like, in, in their universe, they build a quantum field. And sometimes, because they built the quantum field, sometimes there's another universe where they built a portal. And so it just swaps. The machine's just changing what it is because it's a quantum field. So anything can happen at any time. And sometimes it's a quantum field generator that sometimes swaps quarters. And sometimes it's a quantum field generator that sometimes swaps people. And sometimes it's a portal to another dimension. And sometimes this book is a comedic farce, and other times it's supposed to be a serious action drama thing. It was switching that... people the whole time. Oh my god, mind the, blown. Yeah, the, the whole time. That's why there's, it's wildly inconsistent and doesn't make any sense, because we switch dimensions without even realizing it. Oh my god. Like, sometimes Mike's a genuinely nice guy, and sometimes he's a creepy uh, teacher looking at his student's... Uh, breasts and sometimes he's he's a nice guy in a bar being nice to a sad lady and sometimes he's like yeah fuck that girl and sometimes he's a genius and sometimes he's not very bright and sometimes uh doctors perform physicals correctly and sometimes they don't because they were taught different ways of doing physicals in another dimension it makes sense now it's yeah so damn it we were just in our hubris, Nate, in our hubris, we questioned the wisdom of this book. I dared to think it shouldn't have been published because I didn't see it with a publisher's eyes. We weren't supposed to look at it from the perspective of our reality. Okay, so now that we've cracked that code and we realized it's not, it's not a bad book, we're just bad readers... So yes, we're we're the we're the ones at fault here. So yeah, so Mike is is genius Mike now. And he realizes that um the ring or the the quarters are switching and that the field is expanding and my god, we need to shut this thing down. And so, you know, mercifully this time they're in a reality where the scientists don't insist that phenomena happening around their machine and only their machine is uh related to their machine so they they don't argue with him and they're like yep we need to shut it down this time not when we killed bob but quarters are switching (laughs) oh boy (laughs) to be fair quarter was more valuable (laughs) oh (laughs) Oh. zing buddy zing so okay so we gotta shut it down now uh we don't and, and i was thinking maybe we should send jamie through one more time just to check but no no we're, we're definitely shutting it down this time. <laughs> so, Neil, uh, they got to shut down site A, so they lock down site A. They can't shut it off because it's not on. So, uh, they they just lock the building. And yeah, the machine is actually doing nothing right now, but it's required for the portal slash anomaly to exist. My brain filled that in, too. So, I figure whatever they've been doing to the machine has transformed the very matter and space of and around the machine. So it's like the the machine's like dimensionally radioactive now. So those gates, uh, they've they've ripped the dimension so many times that they got dimension juice all over them and they're just they're just lousy with dimension juice. <laughs> and that's causing space-time to warp even when they're not on. Well, they they decide that they need to do the same to Site B. They need to go put yeah, a padlock got, well, on they, that building. Yeah, they got to lock it down. They got to put up a sign that's like, don't go in uh, <laughs> dimension shit. 
And they think, who do we have that can do this? And they're looking around. They're like, well, it can't be the secretary. It can't so, be Jamie. Uh, Sasha, we don't want to risk losing her. Cause Sasha volunteers. Now. Sasha volunteers. But uh, Neil needs some, some space because um, he's, he's, been, he's been cheating on his wife with his wife. Yeah, he's really stressed about that whole, like, he's, he's alternate dimension Neil. And the, the woman he's having relations with is not the woman he married. Not a problem for Mike. <laughs> not a problem for Mike at all. No. Um, but so that's, that's a real big problem for Neil because Neil's not a garbage person. And, 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 so, and so they recognize that, oh, this is like, this is your personality, Neil. Like your, your personality is coming out and you're starting to, to grow as a person. This is your story arc. You go to Site B, Neil. You go there, you majestic bastard. You go alone. You, you go, go alone. You go alone and you take none of the other main characters with you. Because Neil Neil has not seen a horror movie. And he doesn't... Uh, in this universe, they might not even exist. Who knows? So Right. All the horror movies were replaced with old Star Trek reruns. You... Oh, Star Trek? Uh, no, it. because Star Trek was replaced with Assignment Earth. Yeah, it was. Yeah, in in New Jamie doesn't have Star Trek. She has a Simon Earth. That's why her cat's not named Spock. That's why her cat's named whatever the fuck her cat's named. So Isis. Oh god. <laughs> oh oh yes. go boy. Oh yes. This was written in 2015. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck was he thinking? <laughs> was was Al Qaeda not available? <laughs> Oh god, I didn't even think about that. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Oh man. All right. What okay. what is uh so Neil goes to site B and they sit around and talk for a little while and then all the alarms start going off and they all run outside just in time to see site B collapse inward and be sucked into itself like a black hole but then it all stops as site b is like crumbling inward eventually um it stops and, and everything just falls to the ground now neil is uh is he's dead i'm not even he's dead so they he's go super dead yeah he's dead he's done um they look at the security cameras and the the rings the picture in the rings shifted from looking at site A to looking at what what seemed to be the moon. And when they shifted to the moon, um, it started sucking in all the air because it was a vacuum. And it started sucking in the building. And eventually it sucked so hard, it destroyed itself. A metaphor for something. <laughs> I didn't want to say anything. But... They, because this is a sci-fi novel, they notice, because it's a sci-fi novel and they're geniuses, they notice that the things that are getting sucked through the portal, they're not, they're not bouncing like they would in one-sixth Earth's gravity. They're bouncing like they would bounce on, on Earth. <gasps> that wasn't the moon. Oh that my God. was another reality where the earth looked like the moon. And the gate was still standing on that reality. Yes. So the gate destroyed itself and shut off. But the gate at site A is still open. Oh my god. I thought it was, it was pretty uh, convenient that they found out that you can shut the portal off by just breaking the door. And... You know, we, we also got to raise the stakes with the best character, Neil, uh, oh. sadly passing away. I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, who? What are we talking about? I don't know. Did, Something did, you happened. Me, did you give me a croissant? Ah, damn it. No, I didn't. I guess we, I guess we can't have relations. Now. Do you even love me? <laughs> Am I a joke to you? So... <laughs> So at, at this point, I, I think uh, I think we ought to just 
marathon. kind of montage. Yeah, marathon through the rest of the book because if we go chapter by chapter, uh, we I, will never, never I, stop recording this. <laughs> yeah, I could pick this book apart for the rest of my career. <laughs> we would be renaming this podcast uh, The Fold Show. It would just be picking this book apart every single week. It would be deep in the crease with Ben. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I just blew my audio out. <laughs> All right, everyone. We actually recorded these two episodes back to back. And this seems like a good enough place to cut off for now. Feel like this episode and the last episode really laid the groundwork and got us to a good place where we can just lightning round the rest of the story. So, two weeks from now, we're going to have a shorter than normal episode to go with this longer than normal episode we are going to blow right through this crappy book and get on with our lives it's also important to note that ben suffers a mental breakdown so look forward to that and after that if you're keeping up with our podcast and you're reading along with us we're going to be reading marked by sarah fine should be a good one we'll, we'll see you there adios so right all the horror movies were replaced with old star trek reruns you oh, star trek oh my bad uh star Wars. Trors? start it's, it's 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 where captain picard uh blew up the death star um and patrick Patrick Stewart is uh, the Emperor. <laughs> Just think about that for a while. Anyway. I kind of uh, want to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to live in your universe. Looks like Professor Snape. I'm not even making it up. That's the author's own brilliant idea. Like is so <laughs> that is intelligent. true. Mike is so freaking intelligent. He has figurative ants crawling around in his head. Not just your regular boring black ants either. He has red ants crawling around too. Wow, I told you Mike was cool. Mike's ants are so freaking awesome that they process all the data that comes into Mike's freakingly amazing brain. And believe me, that's a whole lot of data. Because Mike has an eidetic memory, or eidetic, I don't know how to say it. Meaning he remembers in detail everything he's ever heard, seen, or experienced. Man, do Mike's ants have their work cut out for them. Klein's obviously fell in love with this ants idea. He could not stop writing about them. I got so tired of hearing about the freaking ants that I even considered pulverizing them into oblivion. Then it occurred to me that using bug spray on my Kindle might not be such a great idea. <laughs>